Good morning, Wheaton College. A special welcome to our Connection students. Let's welcome them once more. And I want to thank you all for being here, but you know, a lot of you, you kind of need to be, you know, at this point of the semester too. So you have a little less freedom. Uh, special thanks to faculty and staff and all those who have come to attend. And a special thank you uh, to my own father. My father, Pastor Cartwright, is here. Let's uh, welcome my dad. I love you. I want to be just like you when I grow up. <clears throat> Look at your neighbor and ask them, who all going to be there? Who all going to be there? You all didn't really ask that. Come on. Nah, come on. I want you to look at your neighbor. If you need to look at your other neighbor, if that didn't go well, and ask them, who all going to be there? Who all going to be there? Yeah. 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 That is the current question that I have. But who knows, by the end of this time together, that might change. If there's anything that I hope that you get out of today's time, it is that you need to accept, we need to accept the most important invitation that we will ever receive. And if we have time, maybe I'll even tell you about something I would consider to be a miracle caught in between this parable. I like invitations. In fact, many friends will tell you that without invitations, I often won't be found at gatherings. I do this for a couple of reasons. One, I don't want to intrude. I also don't want to be an afterthought. I don't want you to be like, yeah, we've been planning this for weeks. Uh, you should come, you know? I'd rather be like, oh, I'll do something else then. I wasn't on the guest list, that's okay, you know? But otherwise, I just want to make sure that I'm welcome in being there. The other reason I like to invite is because it allows me to ask that question, who all gonna be there? See, if I'm being honest, I'm trying to discern whether that party is worth my time. I'm trying selfishly to determine whether I should go to this or if my time would be better spent at all of the numerous parties that I have been invited to recently. <laughs> who all going <laughs> Who all going to be there? Invitations are important. They're important to me. So you can imagine my frustration, uh, my confusion this summer. A bunch of student development professionals from Wheaton gathered in South Carolina, and the first day of the conference, Carter McFarland, some of you guys might know him. He loves you too, random citizen. So, <laughs> so Carter and I decided that we wanted to work out ahead of the conference starting. So the first day, we got up early, went to the gym, and we remembered that the gym was located in the same building uh, as the cafeteria. So we're like, actually, we'll just go to the gym first, and then once we get done with the gym, we'll go straight to breakfast, and then we'll rush back, like shower, get dressed, and then we'll make to the first session on time. Great idea. I remember, great idea. I remember the cafeteria being downstairs, but it was our first day, but I thought that's what it was said somewhere. But before we get downstairs, I won't say who, but one of us, pointed to this nice hall in front of us that had food in it, so it must be where the food is at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So stay with me here. So both of us walk in in our workout clothes and we're like, oh, fancy tables, fancy tablecloths. Okay, they have yogurt parfaits, you know, and they have breakfast items that most dining halls want you to believe don't exist. So you know it's special. But then slowly we start to notice something. No one else is dressed up in gym attire. No one else is in their mid-20s to early 30s. And suddenly we see, thank goodness, we see a dean from Wheaton College, and they recognize him. We're like, okay, okay, good. So we say hi, he says hi, we're getting our food, holding our yogurt parfaits, and without telling us to leave, he very kindly says, yeah, yeah, you know, this is the, 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 the special breakfast for deans and vice presidents. Um, <laughs> in other words, you're not supposed to be here. <laughs> But he was so kind about it, so indirect. And so I was like, oh, we need to leave. And he's like, no, dude. And I'm like, yes, dude. We're not supposed to be here. We're not supposed to be here. So we left. But you can bet we took our yogurt parfaits with us because one day we will be first in the kingdom. All right? <laughs> one day. But today, as you just heard, invitations are important. They could keep you out of trouble. We are in Luke 14. 
as Nims just read, the parable of the great feast. This differs from the wedding feast in a lot of ways that you heard recently, though it does have some similar themes. To help us understand this parable, Luke gives us context at the beginning of this chapter, followed by the parable itself. So let me set the stage for you. Jesus is at dinner. He's rubbing shoulders with religious and culturally significant Pharisees. In fact, he's over the house of a really important figure. And in what is becoming tradition at this point with Jesus, he is healing on the Sabbath amongst Pharisees. He's stirring up trouble, turning up ideas about the kingdom and the kingdom being upside down. He's at it again. He then continues teaching as a rabbi would and implores his listeners to take the lowly place, to be humble, as opposed to taking the high seat and being humbled. And then he goes on to give hosting tips, changing up tradition once again. Instead of inviting the people you know, the people you want to impress, the people who will repay you, he tells them to go ahead and invite the people who would not normally be invited. Send invitations, make room for the people who you don't make room for. Open your festivities up to those who aren't going to repay you, almost as if recognition, status, repayment, and tradition are not the primary goal of hosting people. So already we see that there is a connection here between the temporary and eternity in God's kingdom. The poor are included in receiving a meal that they normally wouldn't have, and the repayment, that blessing, is coming in eternity. And then comes a man who has been listening to Jesus, and I don't know how he said it, but I imagine him being really excited, and he missed the part about, like, the lowly, and said he was just like, wow, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. He's just so excited. We don't know if he was a teacher's pet or he was just so excited to respond, but it causes Jesus to reply with a parable, as this man may not be grasping completely what Jesus is saying. Jesus replies to this man with a story, telling them of a certain man who already invited many people to his banquet. Based on cultural customs of the time, it seems as though invitations would have already been sent out. People would have already confirmed. They would have already RSVP'd. So when the man's servant goes around to tell those who have been invited that the food is ready, he's not alerting them for the first time. It's not a surprise. It's a notification, a reminder, a courtesy reminder, a push message, if you will, that now is the time the banquet is ready. And then the Bible says, came the excuses. Not valid reasons that should be considered for being excused. Also, I want to point out, not evil reasons, right? Not, they didn't cite things that were sinful or wrong, but they shouldn't be considered valid for rescheduling. Not even a courtesy call that told the host that an emergency had happened or a conflict that would cause them to reschedule. Instead, when it was time to arrive, the excuses poured in from three men. And before moving on, I think it'd be helpful to give these three men a chance and explore their reasons and see if their claims are legitimate. Number one, I've just bought a field and I must go see it. You understand. Please excuse me. It's interesting, isn't it? Generally, I don't go around buying a lot of fields, but you would probably inspect a field before you bought it, right? Now, I wanted to make sure, though, so I, I decided to give this man the benefit of the doubt. And in doing some research, I did run across a biblical scholar who made reference to a post-inspection that might have occasionally occurred, but it was almost assuredly not the norm or crucial given his field was already bought. I rate this excuse a 4 out of 10. <laughs> Do better, but at least he asked to be excused. Secondly, a man bought some oxen and was on his way to try them out. What does try them out mean? I don't understand totally what's happening, but again, some of you who have spent a lot of time buying oxen, you probably can help me here. But he was very polite about it. He also asked to be excused. However, he also probably could have tried them out later. He probably could have tried them out before. Did he need to actually miss the banquet? This was like a big banquet. Couldn't he just have done both and had no opportunity costs? And is this the only time he had to do this? Three out of ten. <laughs> and that's being generous. Now, the last one is tough, okay? It's the one I actually feel the most for, because the guy is like, hey, come on. I just got married. All right, we're in marital bliss, you know. He doesn't even actually ask for an excuse. He just says, uh, what does he say? He just says, oh, I just got married, so I can't come. So basically just said, you understand, you get it. <laughs> I do have questions for him too, though. 
We know there was room. So wouldn't she have been able to attend as well? Couldn't he even maybe got a to-go container if she couldn't go? Spent some time there, said everything that he needed to say, saw all the people, shook all the hands, and then took it back to his bride, and they could just sit on the couch, and they could talk and be in marital bliss together. Couldn't have even just taken just a few minutes if she couldn't go with him, because we know that there was room. Couldn't he have taken a brief hiatus from marital bliss and come on over to the banquet? He was direct, but he didn't actually even ask to be excused. Instead of just saying, instead he just said, I just got married, so you get it, I can't come. I find this uncompelling and a generous five out of 10. These these responses angered the host and compelled him to send his servant quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in those who would not have been wanted, who would not have received invites, who would not have been on the standard Jewish invitation list. Bring the poor, he said, and the disabled. The servant did exactly as he was told, and then the master said, go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them, compel them to come in so that his house will be filled. Wheaton, I'll be honest with you, I have at times struggled with this portion of the story. It didn't, it hasn't always sat well with me that there was any time that groups on the margins would not have been invited to the banquet. Maybe you feel similarly, and if so, I have a suspicion that you might be interested in hearing. You see, first of all, this is a parable. So the host that I believe represents God is still not sufficient any more than a feast can properly represent the kingdom of God. But even in the context of his own story, Jesus shines through. You see, I left out a crucial recap of the text just now. I didn't tell you what the servant said when he first returned from inviting the disabled and the poor. Do you remember, Rev? I said, uh, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Very simple phrase. You don't have to shout if you don't want to. Maybe you don't quite get it yet, but that would get me excited. Why? Because whose banquet is it in the first place? Who ordered the preparation of the food? Whose home is it being hosted in? Okay, that belongs to the master in all those cases. Okay, so answer me this. How many men didn't honor their commitments? Three. But you don't see him telling his servant, so go out and find three people in order to fill these seats that I have. Instead, he just says, go get the poor, go get the disabled, go get the homeless, as many as the servant could find, and yet there was still room. Some of y'all are still slowly getting it, and you might not get it until after your afternoon class, so I'll, I'll try to move this along a little faster. For someone to not be invited, that's a whole lot of space to still be open to filling. A whole lot of food prepared for people who supposedly weren't on the guest list. What am I getting at? It's almost as if the Gentiles were always part of the plan. It's almost as if those supposedly left out were never actually forgotten or dismissed. It's almost as if the kingdom's dimensions and square footage had the left out in mind, despite what the guest list seemed to suggest. It's almost as if God invited who was going to be there. If you need further proof of who the master is, I also find it remarkable that in this short story, the host knows exactly where to find the left out. He doesn't ask his servant what we should we do. He doesn't panic because three people decided not to come to the kingdom. Instead, he tells the servant exactly where to go, telling them he will find the socially uninvited. Come on now, that that should tell you something there because if he knows, there's a good chance that a lot of people know. It's not for these banquets they didn't get an invite because, well, we didn't know where to find them. Go to those alleys, go to those ways where they are inhabiting and where we pass them probably every single day. And therein lies the miracle that I promised you at the beginning. See, physical miracles, as we think of them in the New Testament, they change circumstances, they restore shalom or intention, and they propel the receiver to follow God or follow him more closely. While this story doesn't tell us a blind man was made to see or a dead man was raised back to life, I would contend some would see this banquet as a miracle. You see, because of the work of the master, a servant randomly shows up to those in the streets and their location miraculously changes. A servant randomly shows up to the poor and their abundance of food miraculously changes. A servant shows up to the disabled and suddenly their accommodations miraculously change. Circumstances change, design or shalom is restored, and at least for one night at a banquet, they are on their way to the master. 
Now, I'm well aware that this story is about the eternal kingdom of God, but because it's eternal, we find here that God still has time for temporary needs. Yes, Weeden, time is slipping away from me very quickly in more ways than one, so let me bring this to you. The responses of the three guests, they tell us exactly what we need to know about them. However, the updated guest list tells us everything we need to know about the master, yes, about the host. Everything we need to know about God, try as we may, we would be missing out on the feast of a lifetime if we judged it by who was attending. If we merely asked who all going to be there like I like to do and wrestled with whether it was going to be a good or worthy time, we in the name of frivolous and noble pursuits would miss something far greater. I'll go further. If those who claim Christ have the ability to rob you of your belief, you may have put your faith in the church instead of the master where it belongs. If historical and current sin in the body can siphon your love and belief, it may have been misplaced. How can I say this better? If you are hesitant to attend the party, if you left the banquet early, let me tell you this, the host of the party is who makes it worth it. Don't be so distracted by good things, by noble endeavors that you miss out on the banquet like these three men. Don't be so wrapped up in your own expectations and habits that like you, like the Pharisees, like me, we miss the Savior time and time again right in front of us. You see, all those miracles that the Pharisees saw throughout the New Testament, all those teachings of Christ, I see those as constant invitations, constant invitations that were left on red. Jesus was trying to tell them that the Messiah, who you were waiting for, who you've been reading about, is here. Yes, the one you've been waiting on to deliver, the Savior you've been told about, the kingdom that you're hoping would be rebuilt since 587, that kingdom, the protagonist, the hero of your entire story, is here. Yes, the banquet is here. It's now. Yes, if you're already fully planning on attending this banquet, I want to remind you that while you and I will never be the host, thank God, we can be a servant who notifies the guests of their pending engagement. Yes, it's not our banquet. We too were invited. So the onus is on us not to take credit for the party, not to make it what we think a best party would look like. The responsibility is on us as the servant to properly represent the banquet. Yes, to leave no doubt that this banquet is second to none and that all excuses, all other good reasons not to attend or to uh, maybe come late are not needed, are insufficient. Weeding after this text, I have a new primary party question. I no longer am asking who all going to be there. Instead of asking that, I'm going to ask you this question and then take my seat. And I'd like you to, I'm going to ask you and then I'm going to ask you to ask me right back. All right, so stay with me now. Some of y'all are not used to congregation dialogical back and forth. So I'm going to ask you a question. You ask me the same question. All right, does that sound good? And then I take my seat. The new question is simple. It's no longer who all going to be there. It is, you going to be there? <laughs> Why, yes. Yes, I am. By, by no work of my own, by no invitation that I could create, but because of the work of the master, the work of God, yes, yes, I am attending this banquet. Yes, 